God's grace, mercy, and peace be yours today through God our Father and through our Lord and our Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Happy Reformation Day. It's a day that is a great joyful and maybe a favorite for many here today. All that pomp and circumstance, too, that you add into that time of worship. Those tried and true favorite hymns. There's also a little bit of a flavor of something subversive about this day, isn't there? Standing up to an oppressive authority, speaking truth to power, And for Lutherans, what that adds up to is for this to feel almost like our 4th of July a little bit, doesn't it? The hot dogs get replaced by the bratwurst. There's a little bit of chill in the air, and there are no fireworks. But there is a sense of pride, of belonging, of identity that is baked into this day. It's a little bit like those patriotic sentiments that we feel at the 4th of July, too. Luther's 95 Theses are that inciting event that sends off this wildfire of change, kind of like the signing of the Declaration. And then Luther, our Washington, stands up to a tyrannous, out-of-touch, faraway dictator and helps unshackle the church from its burdensome teachings that are found nowhere in the Bible. My hero. Why else would the people who designed our readings for this day combine this text of Jesus talking about freedom with the news of the Reformation, if not for those reasons? Well, today we're going to be digging into what exactly is meant by freedom because we all have a lens by which we approach things. And the lens by which we approach things, and we can't help but approach it this way, is that we have some very specific, cultural-specific ideas that pop into our heads the moment that we hear the word freedom. And the question is, what exactly does Jesus mean in John chapter 8 when he is talking about freedom? Is it what we think that pops into our heads Or is it something else? And what does this have to say, not only to the time of Luther and the Reformation, but more importantly to God's people gathered here today? Jesus tells the crowd in our gospel lesson here this morning that the truth will set them free. What's the truth? Well, you know the truth. It was just shared a few moments ago during the children's message. The truth is personified, Jesus himself, right? Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. That message, that truth, is conveyed in God's word, written, read, and preached through the pages of Holy Scripture as God reveals himself throughout time and places for who he is and what he has done and what he is going to do. That's the truth. And knowing the truth sets you free. Knowing the truth is equal to being a child of God and believing that Jesus is the Son of God, so that by believing you may have life in his name. Believing in Jesus is being steeped in his word, flavored, overcome by him. Being his disciple is to live and be as he acted and promised. Unfortunately, for this crowd that was following Jesus, cheering Jesus, yes, even believing in Jesus in this sermon that Jesus is preaching through a big chunk of the verses right before this, Jesus gets to a point in our text today where the crowd's rah, rah, go, go sentiment comes to a screeching halt, and they say, what? What are you talking about? And the thing that Jesus says that makes them come to that screeching halt is that the truth will set you free. Not the truth has set you free. Not the truth is setting you free. 
the truth will set you free. Which suggests what? You're not free. And the crowds don't like what they're hearing. What do you mean we're not free? We're children of Abraham. We are the very people of God. How can you say that we are not free? We've never been slaves to anyone. Now, I need to point out the preposterous nature of that statement from a purely human standpoint for just a moment, right? I mean, we just go back through the people of God. The the people of God have been enslaved to all kinds of people and under the thumb of all kinds of people, right? Not too long after the time of Abraham, okay, a few generations go by, they go down to Egypt and they spend 400 years in slavery in Egypt. And then after a six to 800 year period of self-governance and freedom, The northern ten tribes of Israel are wiped out by the Assyrians and enslaved. And then a couple hundred years, 150 years after that, the Babylonians come in and take captive those who are left down in the southern part of the kingdom. And then after the people are allowed to return to their land, they're still under the control of foreign powers, the Persians and then the Greeks. And now at the very time that the people are saying we've never been slaves of anyone, the Roman centurions are marching by, right? We've never been slaves to anyone, but let's forget all that for just a minute and go to maybe even the more central point. Jesus makes clear he's not talking about earthly freedom. He's talking about something different. He says it in verse 35 of our text. He is setting us free from slavery to sin. That's the slavery, even when there was self-governance taking place, that led so many of the ancestors of these people to whom Jesus was speaking to turn away from God, to not worship God, God, to not be steeped in his word, even to mix the worship of the one true God with the worship of other gods from the peoples of the surrounding nations. Truth, and thereby freedom, Jesus says, are only found in him. And that's the thing, isn't it? We don't like to hear that we are depending on someone else. We want to be our own person. To be told that you have to be made free is to suggest that perhaps you never really were free in the first place. That perhaps your sense of self-identity isn't what you always thought that it was. Someone making you free says that you need the help. Being set free means perhaps you aren't the one who was granted the ability to define the terms or to say where the limits of the freedom are or the responsibilities that one has to exercise the freedom as someone else is defining it for you. It's very clear. Jesus is not speaking about freedom in our normal way of hearing it in the world, this post-enlightenment concept of freedom as designed, devised, and defined by English philosophers like John Locke or Thomas Paine. That all has its place, but it's not what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 8. So what is it? We'll get to that in a minute. Martin Luther wrestled through these questions in his own time of what freedom means. This is a time well before our definitions of any widespread kind of modern sense of a rights-based freedom were even in play. For Luther, he saw a church that was in bondage in the sense of slavery kind of bondage. 
And that bondage, as Luther defined it, had to do with the teaching of the pure gospel being throttled. What is that pure gospel? That Jesus takes away your sin and the ultimate consequences of your sin, such as eternal death and separation from God. But the church in Luther's day is, in fact, in his view, throttling that truth. And how is it doing that? Well, the church is dispensing forgiveness, the main function for which God designed it to work, right? To share Jesus with people in about the most stingy and cynical money-making scheme possible. By telling people, if you give more, then God will forgive more. God will knock more time off your sentence in purgatory with the right-sized contribution, by making the right pilgrimage, by viewing the correct religious relics. You see, for Luther, too, freedom is something entirely different than our modern American Fourth of July notion of freedom. This isn't about having control over the circumstances of your life. This isn't about self-determination or the oppression of some faraway foreign power. No, for Luther, freedom actually is a lot like what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 8. Knowing the truth, knowing Jesus sets you free. Sets you free for what? Not the kind of freedom that we normally think of. Luther, for his part, used terms like bondage and captivity in his writings about God and the church and his relationship with people. In fact, there's a series of letters that are written between Luther and a philosopher, theologian named Erasmus, and this series of letters is now bound together in a book, no pun intended, called The Bondage of the Will. And the main article, the main point that Luther is pounding on in this conversation is when it comes to things above, things having to do with your salvation, you don't have freedom. You have no free will. Zip. Zero, zilch, nada. You don't get to choose to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord or come to him. It's by God's doing that you are able to believe. You have no free will whatsoever in those kinds of matters. Jesus, after all, is the one who sets you free. And as you know the truth, namely, he himself, the capital T, big T, truth, you are free indeed. So freedom isn't about my free will. Freedom isn't about my self-determination, my ability to make choices to better my life. Freedom is God overriding and overriding your default sin-sick programming that has been corrupted by sin by imposing a patch on you, by putting something entirely new upon you to take away what isn't working anymore. Ultimately, what that's going to look like on the day of Jesus' return is the restore disk that wipes your sin out completely and returns you to original design specifications. By whom? By God, who created us to work a certain way. And if that sounds like being a robot or being an automaton, then praise God, because that's how we're designed to work. Freedom is getting to work the way that we're supposed to work, the way God designed us to operate in the first place. Isn't that what disciples do? Disciples are disciplined, taught, 
molded, shaped, in order to think and speak and act as the master would have them be. That's what disciples do. Now, instead of operating with that clunky programming that is taking up all of your hard drive and your disk space, your memory, now you get freed to work under the influence of Jesus to work smoothly and rightly, loving and serving the people around you the way that God would have it be. He's making you into something new and different. That's the wonderful rediscovery of the Reformation. And it informs our lives today. Because you see, friends, freedom as defined here by Jesus is quite different from the way we normally hear it. Whatever parallels we might experience between the Reformation Day celebration and our 4th of July feeling, in some sense, are almost polar opposite of each other. Because in this, there is no proactive self-declaration of freedom from outside tyranny. Instead, what we have is freedom, liberation from sin, death, and hell. What we have is A freedom that Jesus gives, not of self-determination, not of courage, not of our self-sacrifice, but one that is accomplished for us by the one who sets us free. What we have in the Reformation Church is not a rebellious hero leader who liberates the institution of the church, but rather the Son of God who sets us free through the truth taught in his word. That we are not saved by what we do or by how we please or by how we stand up, but rather that God has accomplished these things for us through his son, Jesus Christ, who makes us free. Freedom, quite opposite of the way we normally think about it, is having our will overtaken, overwritten by someone outside of ourselves, molded, changed, and shaped into someone and something new. Real freedom is based on being permanently dependent, not independent, on God's word and the truth that God makes us free. Real freedom always serves the other person before ourselves. And disciples who are shaped by the teaching of their master live in this gospel freedom, not only as they live their lives in service to others, but also as they depend on God's grace for their failures. Real freedom sacrifices rights, sacrifices what we can do, sacrifices what we want, sacrifices what we determine to be best for ourselves, and instead looks to the interests of the others around us. This is for what Jesus set us free, and Jesus is through whom we are set free. And so, my friends, happy Dependence Day. God bless you today in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may that peace which surpasses all human understanding keep our hearts and minds in faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.